I wear this Wonder Woman necklace. And I wear this Wonder Woman necklace on purpose. Now, we talk very much about leaning into the thing that we want. Nothing happens by accident, right? We cultivate meaning to certain things and that can be either extremely beautiful or it can actually be detrimental to us. So how do we actually do it on purpose? So I took my Wonder Woman necklace and over time I would see in the mirror and I was like, yes, I'm Wonder Woman. You're the superhero of your own life, Lisa. And I repeat that and repetition becomes habit. So I see my necklace, I repeat what it means to me. I do that enough, it now actually starts to mean something to me. And so what I did before I got on stage is I suit up like one the woman does with her cape, like she does with her cuffs. I put my on my big watch, I got my necklace on, I do my hair, and it becomes this stepping stone of, I repeat to myself, you're Wonder Woman, you've got this. Lisa Bill, you welcome to the show. <laughs> so weird, you calling me Lisa <laughs> Bill, you. But you are author, Lisa Bill, you, and I feel very confident in saying soon to be best-selling author, mm. The book is amazing. It's I've great. told you that privately, but I was very impressed. This really is a so radical confidence. It really is the book. One of us had to write a book about the impact theory mindset. And when you started, I didn't know if that's what it was going to become, but it really became a powerful instruction manual for how to move through life well. Uh, so I'm very impressed. I want to start at the end of your book so that people can understand what radical confidence is, and then we'll dive in. But this really hit me, this is very powerful. So this is the literal last chapter of the book. With radical, or sorry, the last paragraph. With radical confidence, you can try new things despite the embarrassment, shame, fear, guilt, or any other emotion that may be paralyzing you. With radical confidence, you can go balls to the wall and risk falling on your face. And you can do it knowing that even if you do break a cheekbone, you can get back up. With radical confidence, you don't have to fear failing or fear whether you're the only woman or the only one with no experience or the only one who shit themselves in a bathroom stall at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. Because homie, with radical confidence, you can zip up your bad bitch boots, remember who the fuck you are, and be the hero of your own damn life. Now, I know that it is a long road between who you were even when you and I first met, but even before that, to writing this book. But for somebody that wants to walk in your shoes, what's the first step to being afraid and doing it anyway? Ooh, what is that first step? Having a plan. Because I don't want it to feel just motivational, right? Like, oh, you know, be afraid and do it anyway. When you're afraid, and you have to do something that scares the life out of you, like step in front of the camera, or start a business, or be a, a leader when you don't know how to lead at all, all of that is really scary. And just telling someone to do it anyway, it isn't enough. So to me, you need an actual plan. Is it a plan or a toolkit? So you need a plan with the tools that you're going to use. So for instance, let's say you want to step in front of the camera. The plan is, okay, I want to start a YouTube channel. So I'm going to shoot five videos in a row without releasing it just to watch myself. Okay, what skill set am I going to build on that? And that becomes what tools do I use to build those skill sets so that I can do five videos. So for instance, the tool, let's say if it's just stepping in front of the camera, it is how on earth can you stare at a camera and talk for 30 minutes? Like practice that skill. And so what's that tool set that you're going to use if you can't even bring yourself to step in front of the camera? Do you look at your clothes? What music do you play before you step in front of the camera? These are all tools to get you to actually step in front of the camera in the first place. Now, what's interesting to me, and because I know your story intimately, but also you go into great detail in the book, is for you, it wasn't a plan. And you struggled mightily in the beginning. And so I want to go back to when we were starting Quest. So give people a thumbnail sketch of basically what happened. So you were a huge dreamer as a kid. You had big dreams when you and I met. And then something went horribly wrong after marrying your husband. Um, what happened? So actually what happened was we had said we want to make movies. And we'd both dabbled in um, trying to work in film industry and we both hated it. So our conclusion was if we wanted to make our own content, we needed to finance it ourselves. So we decided that we were going to go on that path and you were going to go to work 
every single day and I was going to what we called the Steve Jobs effect where I was going to make all other decisions outside of business. I was going to make you were going to handle business. You were going to try and make enough money. I was going to be president of Bill U Enterprises. Did we call you CEO yeah. of Bill U Enterprises? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that felt good. And so I was like, I'm going to do this for a year. Me and you you really did it as well. Like you didn't just sort of ho-hum your way through it. You took it really seriously. Reading the book, though, was devastating for me. Like it, I wept openly the first time I read it. Other people won't react that way because it's not their wife. But for me, reading what a dark period that was for you, like it really was, wasn't the death of a dream because you never gave up fully, but it, it was sort of that dark night of the soul where you have no idea how you're getting back to the dream. When did it go from, I'm CEO of Billion Enterprises and this feels good to, oh my God, how wrong have I let this go? Babe, this is the thing that freaking haunts me. I can't, it's not one day. It becomes that slow stepping stone pattern that you just keep repeating. And I kept saying to myself, it's only gonna be for a year. It's only 12 to 18 months, right? The, the famous story, just 12 to 18 months turned into over eight years. And that's the problem, is that it becomes this slow knock-on effect. And it's like, I can do this, and you have the right mindset, and you have the right framing, and you're like, I'm doing it for the good of us as a couple, of our marriage, we wanna make movies together. So you can freaking convince yourself. You can convince yourself of why you're doing something every single day, and that's the problem. Before I knew it, I was deep eight years into it, and I was like, what the hell happened? But the truth is it never freaking happens overnight. It becomes one little decision that you make time and time again in the wrong direction, that you end up going, how the hell did I get here? Um, and so for me, it wasn't that I was hiding it from you. It wasn't that I was just like, at the beginning, it wasn't like, oh my God, I've got to fucking suck it up and this is miserable. It really did feel like, I am doing it for the greater good. And every day you keep telling yourself that until you almost become numb to how you're actually feeling is what I refer to in the book as purgatory the mundane, where my, my life was just mundane. And every time I started to question, what the fuck am I doing with my life? What happened to the movies that we said we were gonna make? I would soothe myself. And the soothing would be to remind myself that um, it's for the greater good that I made a promise to you, that um, I'm taking care of you, I'm a good housewife. Like that was the belief that I was given as, you know, as a child, that I'd be a good Greek housewife. So you just convince yourself every day. And when I started to um, question it, the ungratefulness would come up. Well, how ungrateful am I? I've got a husband that loves me. Babe, you, I know how lucky I am to have you who loves me as much as you do. And I'm so freaking grateful for that. And for me to look around and be like, I'm miserable. Like, I would tell myself how ungrateful. You, you're living in America, you always wanted to live there. You're married to literally the man of your dreams. I didn't have to work, right? We had a nice little apartment. You were going out and working. You were paying the bills. I didn't have to work. And so every day I was telling myself, I'm so freaking ungrateful for me to rattle the cage. And this is a thing that is really um, haunting me that we talk about a lot of gratitude, right? In the space that we're in, in motivation, it's like we need to be grateful for what we have, making sure that we're using, uh, we're thinking about things in a positive perspective. So every time you may feel bad about your life, it's like, no, look at gratitude, I get it. The problem is it kept me there. Because I kept using gratitude as a thing to go to, every time I felt sad or numb or like what has happened to my life, it filled the hole and that- Wow. And that's how you blink. And in eight years, you just go, I didn't, I'm not even living the life I want anymore. All right, my friend, I have a big announcement. My incredible and talented wife, Lisa, is about to launch her new book, Radical Confidence. In it, she has managed to perfectly capture the process of how to go from feeling lost and insecure to taking control of your life and doing amazing things despite feeling fear, sometimes a lot of fear. Now, let me tell you, nobody knows Lisa better than me, but when I read Radical Confidence for the first time and heard her describe what it was like for her to go from having these big, exciting dreams as a kid to then as an adult, 
scheduling her life around the TV shows that she wanted to watch or how lonely and isolated she felt instead of pursuing her dreams, it was brutal for me. I would never say though that it was worth it for her to go through all of that just so that she could write something down that allows others to avoid it, but I will say that at least she was able to capture the strategies that she used to break out of that rut, find her voice, and begin doing incredible things despite her insecurities and fears that she wasn't going to be good enough to achieve great things. Order your copy today because if you act now, you can claim the bonuses that Lisa has created for you at RadicalConfidence.com. Then, once you've done that, we'll get back to today's episode. All right, guys, read the book and get ready to be the hero of your own life. Peace out. That's really interesting. I've actually, I totally get that, but I've never heard anybody say that gratitude ended up sort of bamboozling them mm -hmm. into living a life that was less than they could live. What do you think about that now? What's your relationship to gratitude? Are you cautious of using it? Because it gratitude is certainly a, I have an interesting relationship to it as well. It's really powerful and it's something that can help you like remember to focus on the right things. But it can, like you said, it can be a salve that maybe keeps you somewhere less than where you could be. How do you think about it now? I think that you should be grateful for things. And when you are and you identify them, they're beautiful. But it doesn't negate all the things that are miserable in your life and that you're unhappy with. And so for me, if I'm actually unhappy with something in my life, I just address what am I going to do about it, right? So being ungrateful is like, I can't believe, you know, like all this shit keeps happening to me. And then going, oh, well, hang on a minute. Look at the amazing things. That really helps me pivot from a negative mindset to a positive one. But when I look at certain things, when we deal with business and goals and actually achieving something, I look at it and say, well, can I change something here? Is this in my control? And I never asked myself that in, um, back when I was a stay-at-home wife. I never asked myself, well, hang on a minute, just because you're absolutely head over heels in love with your husband and you're very grateful for having such a wonderful life with him, I'm freaking miserable over here. And I absolutely have every right to highlight and say, hey, this doesn't feel right. This isn't a fulfilling life for me. And it doesn't negate how grateful I am as, to have you in my life as my husband, but I want more over here and I can do something about it. I never told myself I could do something about it or gave myself the space to allow myself to then make a change. The big thing in reading the book for me was, so I know how I interpret what you went through. I know my half of the equation. I remember coming home and saying to you, don't ask me about my day. I was so profoundly unhappy and was just really trying to make something magical happen for us. And of course, anybody that knows us sort of post success doesn't understand where we started, did not have money, broke, clipping coupons, like the whole nine. And the success ends up coming way later. I mean, we were married for 13, 14 years before we really had any like a real appreciable success. And obviously I know what it was like to be on my side, but not yours. One of the times that I've been most emotionally distraught in my life was before you stepped in front of the camera. I said, no one's gonna ever understand. Like I started getting accolades. I'm like, no one is ever gonna understand how much you have contributed to my success. And now that you stepped in front of the camera, I don't worry about that anymore, but I really did at one point. And what I wanna know is you started the chain reaction that ended up leading to the big change that ends up becoming Quest, where I'd come home so many times and said, don't ask me about my day, that you finally said, your unhappiness is now starting to damage the marriage. You need to make a change. And that, snapped me out of, because I had been telling you, 12 to 18 months for years, so that's like six and a half years by the time you laid that down. And how did you get that courage? Was it because you were doing it for my happiness? Because in the beginning, you weren't self-protective. You've become self-protective. Mm. Did you leverage me as a way to get to that? Like you wouldn't be able to do it for yourself because I think a lot of people are stuck there. Like if they're, they feel selfish doing it for themselves, they feel ungrateful doing it for themselves, but you found that little thing that you could peel away, which was he's unhappy. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting in looking back because the truth is, is that yes, 100% for years and years and years, it was 
we're doing it for the dream. And then that dream ended up turning into, I started seeing you loving business and getting stronger and more confident and you're working on your mindset. So I saw the progression being a positive effect on you. But then that, t- that positive effect ended up being um, destructive. And so you were coming home, hating your work, hating your life. And it got to the point, like I, ca- I could coach myself through it. I can, I find pride, and you know this, in being the freaking strong badass behind you. I don't, I'm not, like I don't see that as a negative. I love being your support system and you being out there and me being like your cheerleader <laughs> and like, hell yeah. And I always have. And so A, when you first started, I was like, this is, you know, I'm your cheerleader. We're going to do this together, but you know, we're doing it for a cause and it makes you happy. And then that makes me happy. But over time, I started to realize it was no longer bringing you happiness and we were no longer working towards our goal. But you kept saying, babe, this is important. I really want this. And the one thing I always said is I know I married an ambitious man. And I remember seeing people divorce as I got older. And I always thought like, who's changing their pitch up halfway through the marriage? And look, I changed my pitch up in our marriage, um, which we can talk about. But I was like, I know who you are. You're so ambitious. You've told me your dreams. You've told me your life goals. And so just because I've got a ring on my finger does not mean that all of a sudden now you need to be home at 6 p.m. and, you know, living the life that I want. We were in this together. It was a partnership. And I always saw it as a partnership until it got to the point where it no longer felt like a partnership. I never, no longer felt like my supporting you was actually doing you any good. You were still freaking miserable. And then the final piece that I swore I would, this is what is interesting. This is where I'll put myself first. Don't mess with my relationship with my husband. <laughs> Whether it's my husband messing with it or somebody else. Yeah. And that almost became that fine, that, that line. Mm. And I said, I will support you. But you have now crossed the line where you're messing with my relationship. And the thing that I pride the most is me and you. Money can come and go, anything. Like there's no prediction of the world. But my relationship with you is by far the most important thing. And when I saw that it was now being messed with and it was becoming dangerous and now me and you were pulling apart and I could start to feel like, I don't, if we don't do something now, are we going to get to the point where there's no coming back? And I had let my life do that, right? With the eight years of just going with the motion, I won't do that with my marriage. And so I think that that's where it came from, the last straw, where I was like, if something doesn't change, me and you are in trouble. Mm. And that I pride myself on, and that's my responsibility as well as yours. Now I need to fix your hair. And then, you know, exactly right. Aww, so sweet. (laughs) I tried to pause to make sure we could cut. that was so sweet. I love that. Thank you, baby. Of course. So (laughs) now for me, what gets really interesting is, so it, there's like a fumbly bit in there where neither of us really know how to make good on this. We're planning to move to Greece. We're gonna do what we love and what fills us up. We get obsessed with this idea that the struggle is guaranteed, but the success is not. Mm-hmm. So like, what would we, the funny thing is, it's all the things that we talk about now, but we had to suffer for us to put these pieces into place. Mm-hmm. But the whole idea of, what would you do and love every day even if you were failing? And so we were gonna move to Greece and I was gonna write and, but my question is, so you have this dream of, okay, we wanna become filmmakers, but you end up going on an entrepreneurial journey and how did you begin to piece together all the tools that you outline in the book? Like how did you begin to bring those together? Did it? Did you, do you feel like you already had a growth mindset? And so as you got drawn into the business, that it was like, oh, I know what to do here? Or were you stumbling one foot in front of the other? Stumbling one foot in front of the other. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's actually really important because this is something that I want to credit you for. So anyone watching right now, if they've got a partner, like if you've got a growth mindset and maybe your partner doesn't or isn't there yet, the one thing that was amazing with me is you were just the proof, the proof was in the pudding. You were reading all this stuff. You were looking into mindset stuff. And I saw you change and I saw you grow. And I saw you being someone who was a little sensitive sometimes and would maybe get 
get annoyed with me over little things. Oh, and things. complain. And complain. I didn't want oh, to say yeah. it, no, but yes, please. you're a bit of a complainer. It, a people do not understand where you and I started. So, okay, can I be honest then? Please. Okay, so you're a bit of a whiner. You would complain about things and you're a bit sensitive and um, like... I remember once I whispered in your ear something sexy as oh, we're playing God, a game. And because you, you missed it, which was obviously my strategy, because I wanted to win the game, you then got annoyed with me. Um, so for the record, my wife whispered something extraordinarily sexy in my ear so I would miss a shot at pool, which I then missed, and I got angry. Yes. That's ridiculous. But given context to who you were, it's so important. Right. So because people don't know that side of you. So I saw that. The former side. The of former you. side but of yes. you. Um, and I saw the change and I saw the growth. And so you weren't forcing me, you weren't putting it upon me. And so that's just a big tip is like, if anyone wants to help their partner, being a beautiful example of how it's changing your life. And then you would make these little suggestions to me that didn't feel pressure. It was like, oh babe, I actually think you'll really like this book. Oh no, you'll hate that. So it wasn't like you were throwing things at me. So I think slowly I started to gain a bit of a growth mindset, but I never had words to it. And so actually, this takes me to a year ago. Bear with me. I, this will, I'll bring it all together. <laughs> a year ago, you came to me, COVID. You got a call from a literary agent. And they asked you, hey, would Lisa be interested in writing a book? And you came to me and you came into my room, office, and you're like, babe, can you believe someone's just said, would you like to write a book? And I was like, do you remember what I said? Yes, of course. I was like, oh, that's nice. And you you're, said something far more terrifying than that. But then you're like, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, did you just hear what I said? And I said, who would buy a book from me? Now, the reason that why... That was I, a year ago. That was a year ago. Just so people don't think that that voice goes away. Right. So A, the negative voice. And in that moment, because I'd done so much work on myself, mm. I was like, oh, bless her. She's still there. Like, I didn't beat myself up over it. But the thing that was, the fear was... I was like, I don't know what I would write about. I'm not an expert in anything. Like literally, that was what I was like, babe, I don't have anything to teach. Like I kind of just do my own thing. I get in front of the camera and I say what I think and that's it. From my perspective, that's hilarious, but I get how people can be blind to their own skills. And yes, maybe. So, but I was completely insecure. And so in writing the book, I realized all the things and tools that I used so going back to your question of was I stumbling, it took me to have to write the book to go, oh, because I'm literally just trying to stumble. You, you fall on your face, how the hell do you get up? You have 40 employees with some of them that are ex-convicts, they're six foot five, and here's me, little British girl that's trying to command a room. I don't freaking know what I'm doing. So I'm just figuring it out. So I'm like, oh, okay, um, well, just shouting at them doesn't work. No one can respect me. I tried that, didn't work. Um, I freaking love hip hop. I love Tupac, he's like my favorite rapper. And these guys were just talking about Tupac. What if I just play the song on the system and then like have a, like a whole like competition and like give free quest bars away to the team on who can pack quicker. So I walk into our quest facility, not knowing what I was doing. I blast the music. I remember you guys are all just like, Lisa, we can hear the music from next door. But I was like, I don't care. And so I blast the music and I'm like, all right, who wants to win a box of quest bars? Who can pack faster? Let's go. And then by the end of it, I'm like, that was a great motivational way of like getting everyone motivated and getting everyone excited. But I just freaking figured it out because I tried other things. I thought, okay, well, if I'm all official, like the, you know, the business books say, like maybe I'll do that and nothing worked. So I just figured it out. And so when I started to write the book and write each chapter, I was like, these are the tools. There are 10 things of ways that, of the things that were getting in my freaking way that would stop me from living the life I wanted. And these 10 things are exactly what took me from being at home supporting you day in, day out. And my life's mission was, do you have clothes when you wake up? And do do you have lunch when you go to work? And when you come home, do you have dinner on the table? That was where I started. And then literally in, you know, this time that we've had together, I figured things out, but not traditionally. And that was the key because I'm like, I just have to say what's real. The messiness of thinking about how, you know, the, the negative voice in my head that's always mean to me. It's just a messy situation of how on earth do you stop her from being so cruel so that you can take those steps forward? And I just tried a bunch of shit and saw what stuck. And the thing that stuck is what I wrote in the book and just like 
this is how you explore it as well. It's not just, this is what I did and that's exactly what you should do. It's the, hey, meditation didn't work for me, but lifting in the gym did. So what is that version of meditation for you? So I've taken things and I've said, this is how you think about it and this is how you move forward to live the life you want. How do people get the courage to dream their real dream? Ooh. How do you get the courage? Yeah, so when you're starting out, and so one of the things that I love about the book is, so for people that don't know, the thumbnail sketch of the, the biography is, so you train as a filmmaker, and you end up generating wealth as a protein bar manufacturer. Like the gap between those is pretty bizarre. And you, you ran shipping. Like if they could see what you did in terms of being in a hairnet all day, working around forklifts, you had a bunch of ex-convicts as employees, things you detail in the book, but it's, it was, it's just dramatically removed from what they know you as now or where you started, what you trained as, how you grew up. I mean, it's just as mm. far away from that as possible. So you get drug into it slowly, right? So it starts with, hey, we're gonna make protein bars nights and weekends, help us manufacture in this kitchen that we rented by the hour. So you would weigh ingredients and you would come and help make the bars. Then it was, hey, we need somebody to ship these, but it's like one a day and you start doing that. And then it's, hey, we can't even do this out of our house anymore. You're gonna have to do it out of my partner's garage. And then it was like, we can't do it in the garage anymore. We have to get a facility. And then it was like, you're not gonna be able to be by yourself anymore. We need racks and forklifts and employees. And all of a sudden, what, a year or two years later, you've got 4D, 40 employees. You've never had an employee before ever in your life. You have 40 employees. We're doing, by the time you left shipping, we were doing 80 million in revenue. Yeah. So I mean, it was like, <laughs> like this monstrous machine. And you never got overwhelmed. I'm sure you were tempted. I'm sure there were times where, I mean, I know you go like to it in the book, issues. where you were just in over your head. You have no idea what you're doing, but you kept solving problems. Mm -hmm. And you call that out in the book. And this is, I mean, for me, this is like the life stance. Figure out how to solve problems. If you can figure out how to solve problems, then you can dream your dream. But how did you get yourself in the mindset of solving problems? That for me, when I started noticing how you approach the world, I was like, oh shit. Like some switch flipped in your head at some point and you stopped, and this of course is a chapter. Um, oh, the chapter title is No One's Coming to Save You, basically. There's a, a better title than that. But that's the idea. You have to save yourself. Mm -hmm. When did that click for you? So there's a lot of questions in there. So first of all, I want to go to the, the, the reason, one of the biggest things of why I wrote this book was really the thinking of the people that are stuck in purgatory of the mundane were every day and they don't realize, like me, what if Quest hadn't come? Babe, I live in utter fear that if Quest hadn't given me that reason to step out of my comfort zone, to step out of what I was already doing and put me in uncomfortable situations every single freaking day that then taught me, oh my God, I'm actually pretty good at this. Like I'm actually, I'm actually not doing it so that other people give me accolades. I actually can feel good about it myself. Quest was that thing for me. It was the thing that forced me into seeing that. But what if that didn't happen? And that's what I'm trying to get with this book. So how did I break it? It was literally every day. So first of all, you come home, my wonderful hubby. He's like, all right, babe, we're gonna do a start protein bar company and our house is up for collateral. Mm. And that was, the big, that was the first thing. Oh, crap. It's do or die. It's do or die. We lose our house or, you know. We make the, it work. Yeah, we make it work. And in that moment, I had the mindset of I was a good Greek housewife that doesn't let my husband down. And I go all in on stuff, whether it's good or not. And so I went all in on, basically, I, I felt good about feeling needed. So when you turn to me and you're like, babe, I really need your help to help ship bars off the living room floor to help make, I felt good about it because I was helping you. And over time, I started to realize what I was made of. I started to realize the skill sets that I was learning. I started to realize what knock on effect that had. So it all started with being uncomfortable, just doing it to be make you proud to save our house. And that started to evolve. And that evolution became, instead of doing it to save my house, it became a mission for me. And it became, I mean, I grew up with a mum who was 
you know, anorexic or borderline anorexic. And when I had that Brittany Burgundy send us an email where she had been in the hospital, she was 40 pounds. She was 40 pounds. That's terrifying. And she was on her deathbed and she managed to get, to get herself back to somewhat healthy. And she said, Quest Bars made me okay with calories again. And thank you for building a community that can accept me. And that's just one of many, many think letters that we got. And I started to realize all these things that I was doing, like figuring out how to motivate my team so we get, get orders out on time, figuring out how to do shipping to um, Dubai for Justin Bieber, figuring out how the hell I build um, racks to put pr protein bars on, how I do first in, first out. I had no idea, no idea what I was doing. But as I started to learn, I started to go, well, would you rather be stuck here and not figure this out? Or would you rather be uncomfortable, figure it out, and help the anorexic community? Would you rather go, well, I don't know, because now I've hit a brick wall and I'm feeling uncomfortable because my skill sets have taken me as far as I'm going to go, and do I throw my hands up? And if I did, that's okay. But could I live with that idea that I would rather be comfortable than help the anorexic community. I'd rather be comfortable than help the, help the diabetic community. I'd rather be comfortable than help the obese community. And that just wasn't okay with me. And every time that I felt like I was hitting a big brick wall, I started to realize, oh my God, this is a mission. I have a purpose. This is actually bigger than me. And that was so thrilling and opened up a world to me I never thought existed. In the book, you call that making your mission possible. Yeah. Little play there, but in like your style. Um, but did you start putting pieces together? Was it a conscious choice that, okay, I'm gonna let this mean something to me? Like how, for people that are listening to this that don't have a mission, how do they get one? Well, we know that you can't find your mission, right, baby? Agreed. <laughs> um, but why can't you find your mission? because it's not just like under a, p a cushion. It's like you have to try <laughs> new things. <laughs> um, I mean, you have to experiment. I never would have thought, I mean, to your point earlier is part of your question. You were like, people, you, you're talking about making movies and all of a sudden you're talking about protein bar and that started this life journey for you. And it's just like, I never would have thought it. And what I started to realize was what was really impacting me even as a kid was that I was doing something that was affecting people and that I had an ability to affect people. And so when I say that, filmmaking is beautiful. You can use sound and visuals and editing and all of that to make someone cry, to make someone laugh, to make someone laugh with tears. Like you literally have that ability just with content. And so what I started to realize is having an impact on people and actually giving someone a feeling was what I was looking for. And I freaking love that. And so as I started to assess what I was doing and the filmmaking part of it, I was like, actually, that isn't the thing that was pulling my heart. The thing that's pulling my heart is helping people. And I think I got there because I ended up stumbling into it. So I think anyone that maybe doesn't have a mission, you just got to try stuff. Because even things like the book, I ne literally, when you came to me about writing the book, I was like, I've never even dreamed about being an author. Like that hasn't, it wasn't on my bucket list. So I was like, wow, do I really want to write a book? And it's like, try it. You never know. And now I'm like, I freaking loved writing a book. But I never would have known if I hadn't tried it. So I think if people don't know what is pulling at their heartstrings, you have to try a bunch of things and then assess what is a thing that's going to literally pull you out of bed in the morning when you're feeling tired, when you're facing your inadequacies, when you're falling on your face and you don't know what you're doing and you're getting people saying, I told you so. What is that thing that is going to pull at your heartstrings that is going to get you to keep going? And if you don't have that, you have to try a bunch of things until you figure it out. So now that you've gone through this, I mean, you've done it many times, but the book is a really concrete example of late in the game, somebody presents an idea to you, who am I to do that? Negative voice, uh, you have no confidence in it. The reason that, that the whole idea of radical confidence is so interesting to me is, look, maybe there really are people like, maybe Elon Musk just does not doubt himself. He's got so much intellect. He's like, I know I can do whatever I set my mind to, but that has not been my experience, that I have to have a belief system that even though I don't feel the emotion, even though my negative voice is kicking in, that I can lean back on this belief system. What do you use 
when you encounter something that you doubt yourself on, you don't have confidence on, what's the mechanisms that you use to get yourself into the position of radical confidence where despite that fear, you're able to move forward? All right, can I use you as an example? Please. All right, so you're amazing in front of the camera. I mean, you're amazing in a way, but in front Very of the camera, kind. and look, um, I've bit my life on that, right? Um, so you're, you really, truly are next level. And look, a lot of people say it, you're not new to hearing that. And so when it came to me being in front of the camera, the pressure that I put on myself, and I'm like, you're so good. Everyone's going to expect me to be as good as you. I need to be as good as you. And then I realized, hey, that's the pressure I'm putting on myself. No one freaking said a word. Now, maybe they were thinking it, but that's me in my own head because I so admired you. Now, that feeling can actually be paralyzing because it's like people are just going to compare with you to him, Lee, so you shouldn't get in front of the camera, right? There's that. Or can I use you as the best guide and motivation on how to keep going forward? And so I decided to use it as motivation. So A, I've already seen you behind the scenes, work through your own anxiety about going on stage, speaking on camera and things like that. And you've spoken about it openly. So A, you are a wonderful um, proof. And I think that's important, right? Someone else who has been there, someone else who has done it. So that was the first thing. I had hell. Do I actually get in front of the camera? Because even if I coach myself, even if I say, okay, I really want to do this, but I'm scared, I can let you get in my way, but I won't, I'll use you as motivation. But how do I still get in front of the camera? How do I shut that negative voice up? And that's where we go back to, like, you've got to have a plan. You've got to have a strategy of what I'm actually going to do. So, in fact, can I take you through TEDx? Please. All right, so TEDx, I was petrified. I started doing more and more content, but I was always petrified to get him on stage. And you were the one that was like, but babe, if you want to impact people, you know, the stage is a really powerful place to do that. So I started to address that. And I was like, Lisa, give yourself grace. You don't have to get on stage, even if you want to create impact, but you have to acknowledge that you are choosing to not go on stage, which will actually have an, uh, an effect on how much I can impact. That's okay. Maybe I prefer to keep myself comfortable. I just have to make that decision. But I have to do it with my eyes wide open. Instead of, in five and ten years, looking back and saying like, God, why haven't I impacted that many people? I know. Oh, it's because you didn't get on stage, Lisa. So I just decided getting on stage is a must. But how the hell do you do it? I've seen you on stage. You're so freaking mind-blowing. And so, how the hell am I going to get on stage, not compare myself to you, but use you as my tool. And so I said, okay, step number one is I've got to just accept to getting on stage. So I made a commitment to myself. The very next person that reaches out that wants me to do public speaking, I'm just going to say yes. <laughs> because I'm scared, babe. I'm so fearful. And I just have to say yes. I can't get in my own head. So I made that rule. And of course, the very next person that bloody reached out was TEDx. So I wasn't expecting that. I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> Couldn't it have been like a high school, you right. know, small class? Um, but I made the commitment. And so if I'd said no to that, now I'm just not, I'm letting myself. And so at this point, you're anchoring off the mission. So I've got a yes, mission. I want to impact people. Yes. So that's like the tugging of the heartstrings. Yes. Then, okay, I'm going to make myself a promise. And I'm the type of person that's high integrity. So I make this promise. And you, of course, told me. So now it's out in the world. Mm -hmm. So you're building this momentum, basically forcing you, because what's interesting is I'm beginning to get this thread of like, you need a bit of do or die. Yeah. You need the house to be online. Mm. You need to be a good wife, Ooh. I must do this. To get myself on stage, I have to be thinking about the people that I could help that, and I know you, you're holding like real images of real people and the amount of suffering and struggling that they're going through and you have ideas that might be useful to them. So that's mm. like how you're building this Yeah, that's narrative. interesting, the do or die. It's true, yeah, because I get in my own head. And it's in those moments where it's do or die, it's like, all right, Lisa, well, what's more important to you? No judgment, like literally no judgment, but just ask yourself, what is more important to you? Helping the anorexic community or helping people who are depressed? Right, that's, that's our big thing, like the, the creating impact with people who, who struggle with mental health issues. And so what is more important, no judgment, no pressure, but is it more important to help this person over here who maybe is your mom, Lisa, because I can very much relate to that, 
Or is it more important to make sure that you're not uncomfortable and petrified and going on stage? Because what if, if your own, you know, um, my insecurities are just too crippling and that's actually more important to me right now than helping people, just own it. I don't want that crippling anxiety of like, oh my God, but I should be, and I should. No, no. Look at the situation with your eyes wide open and make a decision. And so in those moments, I just ask myself, what's more important? Helping these people or, and, you know, the anxiety I'm feeling about getting on stage. And I was like, this doesn't sit well with me to not go on stage. So I'd made that commitment my, to myself. Thank you for breaking that down. Um, and now, how the hell do you actually step on stage? Because going through the stages is one thing to say yes. It's a whole other thing to fly to the event, prepare for a speech, get on stage and give it. And I, I, it's just the crippling feeling. I mean, even now, I've got my stomach's doing nuts <laughs> just talking about it. Um, <laughs> and so I had to have a plan. So it basically is, what are the tours that are going to help me get on stage? And so a few of them are the way that I dress, my hairstyle. I wear this Wonder Woman necklace. And I wear this Wonder Woman necklace on purpose. Now, we talk very much about leaning into the thing that we want. Nothing happens by accident, right? We cultivate meaning to certain things, and that can be either extremely beautiful or it can actually be detrimental to us. So how do we actually do it on purpose? So I took my Wonder Woman necklace, and over time I would see in the mirror, and I was like, yes, I'm Wonder Woman. You're the superhero of your own life, Lisa. And I repeat that, and repetition becomes habit. So I see my necklace, I repeat what it means to me, I do that enough, it now actually starts to mean something to me. And so what I did before I got on stage is I suit up. Like one the woman does with her cape, like she does with her cuffs. I put my on my big watch, I got my necklace on, I do my hair, and it becomes this stepping stone of, I repeat to myself, you're Wonder Woman, you got this. And then you- Where did that idea come from? So you refer to it as your bad bitch boots. Mm -hmm. When did this start becoming a thing for you, the idea of sort of armoring up and signaling to yourself? Because in the book, you refer to yourself as ordinary woman mm. in reference specifically to Wonder Woman. Yeah. And you're saying, I'm not Wonder Woman. I'm ordinary woman. I struggle with this stuff. And I wish people could have seen you because I think they would be more inclined. Because here's here is my big fear with radical confidence. So people will glance at it and be like, I'm not radically confident. Sure, it's fine for her. You know, look at, she's got this crazy bold hairdo and these tight pants and these, you know, insane boots. People like that, yeah, of course, like things come easily. But if they could have seen you in the bedroom when you were practicing your speech for <laughs> TEDx yeah. and you were terrified. Terrified. My terrified. voice was like, <laughs> when it was just you and I. I know and bless you. And practicing over and over and over. That's what makes it dope is that you were scared. Yeah. And so walk us through this idea of these bad bitch boots. So yeah, again, I, I called them that because I needed something to keep motivating me. You're Sasha Fierce. Yes. Right? Isn't that what? Uh, sure. Yes. I'm Sasha Fierce. <laughs> but uh, Beyonce. Yeah. That was her alter ego. Her alter ego. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like it becomes a. And it, thinking of the superhero language, it becomes this part of you that is kind of a little shy and embarrassed to say it. Like it becomes this alter ego, this like superhero thing, which is why I use that language. It doesn't actually become embarrassing anymore. And so even talking about my cuffs and building up, it's language that I use on purpose. I say it on purpose, I'm putting on my cape. Because saying otherwise, like I'm putting on my, my shoes because I'm petrified to get on stage, doesn't quite have a ring to it, right? <laughs> like, but to say like, I'm putting on my cape, so I got this, it makes a difference. I even do the face. Um, and so with my boots, it became a like, as I walk, so A, I think it started with you. You probably saw them and were like, oh my God, you look so sexy, right? So it's like someone says something to you, you actually feel it as well. And so when I feel it over time, when I would go and put on these boots, these ones here, when I would go and put them on, it would usually then be on nights that I was trying to be sexy and we were having date nights. So now I'm reinforcing what they mean to me and how I feel when I wear them. I feel hot, I feel sexy, I feel confident. So now it becomes a tool 
And then, how do I lean into it more? Give it a freaking name that makes you feel badass. And it's like, you've got my bad bitch boots. It just has a ring to it. So I started to say it and then it became the thing and then now it gets repeated and now it becomes, everyone's like, yeah, the bad bitch boots. So how do people at home really lean into the things they need? The alter ego, the, the design, the things they wear. But it absolutely works in the opposite. Like all these are tools to help you feel a certain way. So if you don't know which your bad bitch boot or your version is, go into your closet, try a bunch on. Go to freaking Target and go in their shoe section and literally just try shoes on. Go into their clothes section and try it on. You don't have to buy stuff. Like just try it and see what works. And then lean into it. Hello, my friend. You know that I believe success requires you to see failure as the ultimate learning tool. Success requires you to be disciplined and gritty and to never, ever quit on your dreams. I say all of that because one thing is certain. The road to achieving your goal is not smooth or linear. I wish it was, but it's not. It's going to be bumpy, sometimes scary. Some days you'll take two steps forward and slide 10 steps back. And that's why success also requires you to know how to pull yourself out of a rut and get unstuck fast. Life is short. You can't be messing around with your goals. You've got to make progress every single day. So I've pulled a class from Impact Theory University called How to Get Unstuck, which you can watch for free with the link on your screen or by clicking below. When you join me for that free preview of that workshop from Impact Theory University, I'm going to teach you my strategy for how to understand exactly where you need to be going, how to identify the obstacle that's blocking you, and the best way to make the most progress towards that goal and keep your momentum. All right, click that link and let's get to work. All right, I'll see you on the inside. So that people understand you're not going to feel invincible. The people that you look at do not feel invincible. It's the people that are able to overcome that hesitation, the fear, by either, okay, I have to put myself on the line. I know if I don't do that, I'm not gonna move through. I have to hold myself accountable. I need to make this about integrity. I have to practice. I have to make peace with my negative voice. In fact, one of the chapters in your book is make your negative voice your bitch and your BFF, right? And to understand that relationship that you're never gonna be able to make it go away, but you have to be able to understand it, to work with it, to leverage it, to find a way to still take the steps. And that, that's why I wanted to start with that end quote of this really is, this isn't about getting rid of fear. This is about coexisting with it. Mm. Uh, there's a John Wayne quote, um, courage isn't the absence of fear, it's saddling up despite it. And so that idea of like, I'm putting on my bad bitch boots because I need to construct this mindset, right? I need to build my way of thinking, my way of feeling. I need to understand what are those things that are gonna bring me together in this moment so that I can figure it out, right? And that's the punchline. I'm gonna figure it out. It isn't I put on the boots or I wear a cape and suddenly I am, you know, just magically have all the answers. It's that I'm, I'm just not gonna quit. I'm not gonna give up. I'm going to have the courage to stand in this discomfort long enough to learn. Mm-hmm, a hundred percent. And yes, the boots alone don't do it. And sometimes they may not work if you haven't got all the tools and you don't know where you're going or what your, your purpose, like your why. And how the hell do I just keep moving forward? It's not about feeling good about myself every day. It's not about how do I get rid of the fear? How do I overcome the fear? It's about how the hell do I impact that person? And what are the skill sets I need to build along the way so that I can get to it? And the fear sometimes comes along with me. The insecurity sometimes comes along with me, a lot of the time. The, the negative mindset of who the hell do I think I am is always there. But I just don't let her stop me and I use her now to my advantage to help me get to where I want to go. And I think that that's the biggest thing with um, many people is identifying what is that end goal. What are you actually moving towards? There's two ideas in the book that I think most people would consider contradictory, but I think are so important. One is something that people have heard you say a lot today, which is no judgment, no pressure. Mm -hmm. But the other is, one of your chapter titles is Toughen the Fuck Up, Buttercup. Yeah, buddy. So how do I reconcile those? Or how does somebody that maybe is new to a growth mindset, how do they make those make sense together? Um, all right, so 
Why do you say no pressure? Because it's your life. And I think that we feel the pressure of judgment by others, how other people are going to react or how I'm going to be perceived, that we make judgments based on the, the, un, the worry, the concern. And to me, it's like, it's your life. If you don't want to do this, there's no pressure. Like, it's your freaking life. So I say it to almost shed all the expectations and the shoulds and musts that we've so been, um, you know, programmed to have. So I think it's just so important to say when you ask yourself these questions, you can't put the pressure on yourself about the judgment, the shame, and what will come from answering it. You just need the truth. So by removing the pressure, you, to me, I was able to answer a lot of the hard questions in my life that I was so worried about asking. Because then you're able to steer towards what you really want? Yeah. So then why toughen the fuck up? If it's really just about, hey, live your life, be honest, be authentic, uh, it's okay if you don't want to do that. But now imagine someone says, I do want to do it, but it's really hard. Toughen the fuck up, buttercup. <laughs> like, it, right? It's like, again, it's if this, and I say that in joking, but the truth is, is that if you have something you really want to get to, a goal, and you're just deciding, yes, it's going to be uncomfortable, but I'm going to do it. The whole point of the chapter is you can absolutely toughen up. Like who you think you are today, all your weaknesses, you've got this. You can freaking get stronger. But also the buttercup side of it is actually a beautiful side that I try to keep. And so there can be moments, and I talk about like um, caring about what people think, right? It's so, and so I do care what people think. And that's, I think, the beauty of me, the soft side, the thing that like I do want to be liked. But the toughen up is I want to be light, but not to the detriment of my freaking goal. So you better believe I've got to get tough. I've got to set boundaries. I've got to um, really own what I want. I've got to speak up. And I can't be too sensitive because all of those things will get in the way of me getting to my goal. And so it's about embracing the beauty that can be you, but also not telling yourself that you're too weak or that you can't do something and that I'm telling, like the, the, the chapter is supposed to have utter compassion with a whole fire and a kick up your ass all at the same time. Because to me, sometimes I need the compassion. Sometimes I need the softness, but I can't stay there. And what happens is if I stay there too long, I think something's not possible. And I like to take ownership over it. So the toughening up is to say in moments where maybe I feel sensitive in a meeting with you, I don't have to be sensitive. I don't have to take that to heart. I can actually look at the situation and actually identify emotion and say, this doesn't have a place here right now in this business meeting, let's say. And that's just something that it doesn't have to be one way all the time. I think you can have the beauty of being um, compassionate and having a heart and caring about what you do. And you can also be freaking tough as nails and step up to the plate, bat in hand and freaking call your shot and swing as hard as you've got because you're freaking tough. And so that's where that comes from. Kim Kardashian burned the internet to the <sighs> ground by telling women to work harder. I think that this idea is reminiscent of that. Do you agree with that? And what's the nuance that you wanna make sure that people understand when you say that you need and one, I think it's important that people understand that when you're writing this stuff, you're writing to yourself. Yeah. Like this is, these are all the things <clears throat> that you have had to tell yourself mm -hmm. in order to have the success that you want. That this isn't you admonishing anybody else. This is you going, okay, I was in this situation. I was scared out of my mind. Let me tell you how I got to the other side and, and actually built the life of my wildest dreams. But do you... Do you worry that people will misunderstand that idea? Or is it like, man, I wish it weren't so, but you really do have to get tough. You really do have to put in the work. Like, how do you read that? I think it all comes with intention. So I think she just may have a reputation. I don't want to speak for her. But I heard that one line, I just heard that one section where she was like, 
what was it like ladies if you want to achieve something you're gonna have to work hard or something yeah i don't think people want to work these days like you gotta get off your ass and work hard yeah i thought it was fire so the part about get off your ass and work hard word like absolutely 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 we did not have this everything we have by sitting on our ass and i freaking busted my i busted my ass so damn much that i ruined my entire health so I'm not actually advocating for working that hard, but 100% I still work very hard. And that's beautiful. I love that about myself. I love that about saying I don't deserve that. Like my YouTube channel, I have to freaking work hard. I have to show up every single freaking day and work hard for every subscriber and I'm willing to do it. And I don't expect people to come to my channel for no reason. I only expect them to come to my channel if they see that I bring value. So that's on me. That's not on anyone else. So I absolutely own that. Now with the Kim Kardashian thing, I just think it comes to intention. Now maybe people don't see her in a certain light. And I did really worry about that with the book. And I said, all I can do is be truthful. I can be truthful about what happened with me. And so even earlier where I said, don't be too sensitive. There were moments where I let my emotions take over and being sensitive in that moment didn't serve my goal. And it ended up not serving the meeting. And so when I think about Women say, no, you should own your sensitivity 1,000%. But sometimes there's no place for it. If you want to achieve your goals. That's Correct. the thing I think that has to be said out loud Correct. for people to get it. It's like, hey, no judgment. You don't need to go after big goals. But if you want to go after big goals, there's just a reality. Can I give you a Churchill quote that I think will fuck you up when I heard it? Now, this is a mashup of Ray Dalio prefacing a... Uh, Churchill quote, but I think you need them together. So put together, it goes like this. By and large, we get what we deserve. And as Churchill said, deserve victory. Mm -hmm. You got to deserve victory. Now, that's a word that's going to spin people the fuck out of control, is deserve. Now, that's me and Churchill saying it's not you, <laughs> but I want to get your read on that idea. I think it just comes to what life do you want? Like, if you don't want to work hard and you don't want big grand things, have a life you want. I'm not telling everyone to go out and work hard. Like I'm really not. And so, but if you want a, to run a business, for instance, if you want a successful relationship, the only way I, Lisa Billy knows how to do it, is to put attention, time, and focus and priority. That's what I've done with my business, that's what I've done in my relationship, and that's where how we've gotten to 20 years. Now, some people say, I don't think relationships should be work. Okay, cool, then don't work on your relationship. It, let me know how it goes. Hopefully it works, <laughs> but I actually mean that. Hopefully it works for you. I just couldn't find that work for me. I couldn't find that not paying attention to you and not caring how our relationship, did, or not giving time to it. I haven't seen how that leads to me and you having a successful relationship. So I had to remove the worry about what people think about my opinion because I have my North Star. Going back to what the book's about, the fear and doing it anyway. Of course I have the fear. Of course I have the fear of someone picking up the book and saying, who the fuck does she think she is? It's all right for her, whatever. Whatever words they're going to use. I can't worry about that. All I can do is focus on what is that goal? Impact. Am I being truthful to my story, to what I've learned along my journey? Yes. Do I think it's universal? No. And so I can't worry about whether everybody likes me or not, because the truth is, no, not everyone's gonna like me. Just let me just set myself up for success right there. <laughs> but if what my advice is true to me and exactly how I have gotten where I am, and I do actually try and frame it like this is just what worked for me, but now you have to find that version of for you, that version for you. So yes, I'm fully prepared that people may pick up the book and hate it. And I just said, I poured my heart and soul into it. And this is actually a really powerful thing that because of all the mindset that I've done in the past allowed me to do this for this book, I knew I would be devastated if it tanked and didn't do well. Like anything, everyone puts their heart and soul, you put a year into working on something and no one likes it, I would be crestfallen. But I wrote a chapter called Validation is for Parking. <laughs> and so my point being- Your chapter titles are great, by Thank the way. you. <laughs> and so the point being, I cannot get my validation from whether this book succeeds or not. 
And so as I was writing the book, I even spoke to you about it and I was like, I need to make sure that this doesn't knock me to my knees if, if it doesn't do well. Mm -hmm. And so how do I do that? How do I get my validation? But um, how do I feel good about myself in writing the book but not get the validation out of the outcome on whether it succeeds or not? And so I made a commitment to myself and I said, all right, Lisa, give the book everything you've got. Like, give it everything. Leave everything all out on the table. Don't like take, you know, of it. I took time off for my own health, but like, don't just be like, ah, it's fine. Oh, we've got an audience, they'll buy it. No, no, give every ounce of your being to this book so that before it even goes out on sale, you can be bloody proud of it. Because that pride before it goes on sale is a thing I have to hold on to for God knows how long. Um, and so I processed it went all in and I literally, by the end, I was like, I'm freaking proud of it. And so now, however people perceive it, I obviously really hope that it creates impact um, because that's my North Star. But if it didn't, I'm still okay with the fact that it failed. It will still sting, I'm not gonna freaking lie. Mm. But I won't then take it as my validation, my value or my worth. I'll be proud of it and I'll just say, all right, if your North Star is still impact, you shouldn't write another book because no one bought it. No, I, I would not take that message away. Interesting. The book is usable. It is so useful. You've encapsulated the ideas of how you approach success and getting what you want in life. I guarantee whether it sells or not, you've captured the ideas. It's usefulness to me is the thing that you should be most proud of. Now, whether we're able to sell it is a whole different question. I think it's gonna sell like fucking hotcakes because it's unbelievably good. But, and, and I really mean that, like it, it, so when we started this journey, I thought I was gonna write a book as well and realized that wasn't the path that I wanted to walk. And maybe one day I'll bring a ghostwriter and however good they can make it, just take Impact Theory University and turn it into a book. But when I read this, I was like, oh my God, like you've captured the ideas that this company was designed to put out into the world. And so, yeah, let that be. You poured your heart and soul into it. And so the sincere pursuit of something to me is far more valuable. You obviously, at least between you and I as, as husband and wife and business partners, you clearly, put everything into this book, uh, but you've captured extraordinarily useful ideas extraordinarily well. Thank you, baby. I would think I was just saying that um, if something succeeds or fails, it doesn't necessarily equate to how much time and energy and heart you put into something. Facts. And so I used to, though, that sort of thing I would take very personally. I would take it as a reflection of who I was as a person and what I have to offer the world. And oh my God, I'm no good. I can't believe it just embarrassed myself. Like all of that used to be the mindset that I had. And so being able to very easily say, I'm freaking proud of it, no matter how well it does or doesn't do. And if it doesn't do well, like, Maybe I don't write another book because maybe it doesn't create impact. And maybe now I just reflect and go, I really enjoyed it, but I don't want to spend another year of my life on something that doesn't actually, you know, create impact. And that's okay. And I think that that's the point that I was making is that doing something back to what you were even saying about mission. How do people find your, their mission and their purpose in life? It's trying things like that and then seeing if I wanted to write another book, I would just say, okay, now that I've written one, what am I going to learn from it? And what am I going to do differently? So it actually does create impact and I assess. So failure is just an opportunity to learn. And so how can I learn from this? And if I want to keep going, I will. Um, but making sure that I'm not tied my um, self-esteem to it. That's the key. All right. The team has put something together for you that I want you to see to make sure that you understand that these ideas that you've put out verbally up until this point, and I'll let them move that, I guess. Uh, so go ahead and wheel that bad boy what up is here. What's happening? Uh, yeah, you have a view on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, you've been putting these ideas out into the world, and so we wanted to reach out to people who've already been impacted by the ideas that you've outlined in the book. Because hearing how people are using this and how they're using it to start businesses and to change their lives is pretty amazing. For people watching this, you had no idea that we were putting this together, at least as far as I know. No. Uh, it's pretty cool. All right, take it away. Hey, Lisa. I just wanted to pop on and give a big thank you. I cannot express my gratitude for all that you do and what you stand for. 
If you didn't step into your purpose on this journey, I would not be the mom, business owner, or woman that I am today. I found you years ago after obsessing and binge watching Tom on Impact Theory. But it wasn't until I found you and Women of Impact that I really started to find and define myself. Listening in every day to Women of Impact not only changed me, but it literally transformed how others saw me. I want you to know your hard work is not overlooked. I want to give a moment of appreciation for all your efforts. Because of your impact, I show up each and every day without guilt, fear, or doubt getting in the way. Because of you, I have learned to turn off the noise and live my life free to explore with excitement and confidence. I can live in confidence because I know whenever I begin to feel that doubt creeping back in, I can always go to any of your platforms for accountability. So thank you, Lisa, for being you, for going first and being the example, for working your ass off for women like me who believe we couldn't come back from our trauma and loss. I cannot wait to get your new book and leave it on my nightstand. It will be a great constant reminder for me to show up for myself with radical confidence each and every day. So congratulations, Lisa, on your success and good luck on all of your new and upcoming achievements. May you embrace and enjoy the journey in good health and abundance all year. Hey, Lisa, I'm Katie Moran. I asked you a question on ITU Live about self-confidence and you told me about self-signaling. It changed my life. My confidence was so low from anxiety that I couldn't speak, my voice would crack, or I would be completely inaudible. I started self-signaling and created an online store, Equanimity Boutique, to share uplifting messages through self-signaling with others. Now I've started a podcast and recording audio of my three books, voiceovers for NFT projects on suicide prevention and lucid dreaming, and spoken word for a music album. Thank you so much, Lisa. You've made a difference in my life and every life I touch. Hi, Lisa. Shelly here. I am so excited right now. I never thought in my lifetime that I will get an opportunity to express gratitude for everything that I do and the impact it has on my life. It's amazing. I remember once I got an opportunity to ask you a question in one of the live IT coaching sessions. And I asked you on how to set boundaries and how to deal with past relationships. And the guidance that you gave me, it helped me so much. I found the courage to deal with the past. I am so focused on the present. And most importantly, I am learning to prioritize myself. Thank you so much for that. I can't thank you enough. I am like a different person to have never felt this way. So thank you so much for that. And a special shout out for all the women of impact episodes that you do. It's so amazing, so powerful. It's like a daily reminder for me to believe in myself and keep working hard to be the better version of myself and to believe that I can achieve and I'm capable of doing it. So thank you so much for everything that you do. I can't thank you enough. I can go on and on about everything. But thank you so much. Keep doing what you're doing. It's just so inspiring. Thank you. Hi, Lisa. My name is Eva, and I am an entrepreneur who lives in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I'm one of the OGs from Impact Theory University, and I wanted to congratulate you on the release of your book. But I also wanted to let you know um, about a situation where I got advice from you, and it was amazing. I was brave enough to ask you about a critical self-narrative in an Impact Theory University Q&A session. And you told me that, A, I should be kinder to myself, but B, that critical voice never goes away, but I can leverage it to be better. And I have a screenshot from that conversation that I keep at my desk at work. And I've been really going out of my way to be a kinder and better friend to myself. So thank you on behalf of myself and all the Impact Theory University students for holding space for us and for answering questions and taking the time to give us tremendous advice that's meaningful. Thank you so much for your time. Hey Lisa, it's Renee. You know, it was just a little over a year ago where I came to you because I had no confidence. I wanted to start a YouTube channel on making handbags and you encouraged me to do that and sure I did it. And I grew that channel and wow, what a difference that made in my life. 
After that, I started facilitating a goal setting group in Impact Theory University. I released 30 pounds in um, a 100 day challenge, won the challenge. Then I, um, then I got certified with Tony Robbins and Chloe Madonis as a life coach. Loved it so much. Now I'm learning how to tra um, trade crypto and stocks. It's just amazing the difference in my life. I am not the same person, girl. It's just amazing. Radical confidence. Radical confidence. The skill sets I have learned and I'm getting to teach others, it's just incredible. None of that would be possible had I not had that conversation with you. You have no idea the difference this has made in my life. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. Wow. So what I love about the video is that you get a chance to hear people that are actually using these ideas in their lives. And, you know, Renee at the end really sums it up. Like, She's learning things she never thought she would learn from, you know, starting the handbag business to the YouTube channel to becoming a certified coach with Tony Robbins to learning about crypto and NFTs, all things that she wouldn't have had confidence before because she thought, well, if I have a negative voice, that's a sign that I shouldn't pursue it. Mm -hmm. And so for people to be able to get the toolkit to have the process that they can run to actually move forward, to stand in that long enough to figure it out. Like that to me is why this book is so incredible, why I'm super glad that you wrote it. So at this point, where can people follow you? Where can they get the book? <gasps> oh, that was really emotional. Um, sorry, I just need to take a minute. Take you can follow me you. at Lisa Billu on Instagram and pretty much everywhere else, I think. <laughs> um, and radicalconfidence.com where you can get the book and there's a bunch of amazing bonuses over there. And um, You go ham on TikTok? I go ham that. on TikTok, yeah. And the book, my partner's over at Amazon and Target and Barnes & Noble, whichever one people want to get. So There it is. Guys, obviously, I am insanely biased, but I will say that I don't think she's amazing because she's my wife. She's my wife because I think she's amazing. And this book is an encapsulation of the impact theory ethos. Man, woman, doesn't matter, regardless of your age. This is a book that everybody that's gotten value out of this channel should read. I've read it multiple times. It is amazing. It succinctly puts together all these incredible ideas in a way that's gonna be highly usable for you in your life so that you can make the kind of changes that you want to make. I promise you this book will change you forever if you let it. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us and speaking of things that will change you forever if you let it. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. Every single moment is an opportunity for us to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. If I'm miserable, if I'm upset, if I'm angry, if I'm cranky, it is my responsibility because it's what I'm doing up here that's making me have that reaction. And if I'm the problem, I am also the solution. Mm -hmm.